Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. The body of a child of God is subject to disease and death in this world, but when the glory of God's children is completed on the last day, it will be raised up in glory and will shine in union with the soul, as Christ's body did on the Mount of Transfiguration. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they delivered. Today, we're going back to 1843 to listen to a sermon by William Chalmers Burns. It was preached in Dundee, Scotland. Troy, William Burns, um, I feel like we're, we're going through the research process for this episode, we kind of, so we kind of teased this a little bit in uh, in the McChain, McChain, not McChaney, McChain episode <laughs> where uh, we said that there was a, a funeral sermon that was coming. It, w- McChaney dies and it's this William Burns that preaches his funeral sermon and that kind of opens the door to the who's this William Burns guy and that's sometimes how we do a lot of this revive thought stuff Actually, you, read, yeah. you read about a person and then you see this other minister interacting with that story and their their paths cross and then you uh, keep looking into that other guy, and then it's just a, an endless yeah. train of people. But yeah, it's actually a good way to say it. Like honestly, reading church history, like y- y- you would think it's this linear thing, one person to one person to one person. But so many people, especially by the time you get to the 17, 1800s, start to kind of crisscross over each other's paths. So it starts to look more almost like a spider web, where you're like, oh, this mm. connects here, and that connects here, and that connects here. And this guy, William Chalmers Burns, I got to tell you, I think he should be a household name. I think he should be a very famous individual who is up there with your your Hudson Taylors and your uh, your your Charles Spurgeon. Maybe not maybe not for preaching per se, but just a famous guy that people should know through history. And as I was reading, just all the things that this guy has been a part of, all the things this guy has done, and just the influence he had on the world. It, it's just another one of those guys where I go, I can't believe we have forgotten completely that he ever even existed. He's not known to the world. I, 99.9% of Christians have never even heard of him. And yet he was such an important figure and did so many different things. And it, it just, I'm glad that we get to be a part of hopefully bringing his life back to some people, but it, it's not enough, man. I wish there were more people digging digging through history, looking and researching for these people and getting these people back out there. We need more of it because there are just way too many amazing people that have been completely forgotten. Yeah, he almost reminds me of like, uh, because he's, he's so kind of connected. His story overlaps with so many people in the late 1800s that uh, it almost seems like fictitional. You know, like if it was yeah. like a, if there was like a movie about a fictitious fictitious guy that happened to cross paths with all the main characters you know that was kind of like red <laughs> exactly. in. that's that's kind of how it yes. feels to me but it's like that, he's a real that dude is, that is a good way to describe you know he does like when he shows up later on in the story the person he bumps into you just kind of like wait a second this is just somebody the, the the writers in the room were like we want to do a callback to season two here that's all that is some fan no, service, there's yeah. no there's no there's no explanation for how you would pull these two together and yet that's exactly it all right, Joel, we always try to read some positive responses, though, here to Revive Thoughts where we can, just to let you know that we listen to and read your comments when they come in, and we appreciate them. They do help us a lot. Uh, these two both come from Spotify today. One is from John uh, on our John Nelson Darby episode of The Wheat and the Tares. Someone said, ah, this is one of my favorite theologians. Thank you so much. Well, you're, you're welcome, Peter, for helping you out there. And then another person said on our Watchmen Knee episode, and this one stood out to me because that is a really old episode. I mean, that is going back to mm. the first year of Revive Thoughts was our Watchmen Knee episodes. And uh, this person said, keep it up with these messages four days ago from the Berean Book Ministry. And I want you to know, if you're all the way back in that episode from our first year, we did keep it up. So I don't know uh, where they're at in this process, but if you're if you're starting at the beginning and moving through, I we kept going. It's been it's been going a long ways, and uh, it's got a long ways to go. So, but thank you so much. Leave us comments on Spotify or wherever you are listening. It, it helps us out a lot. It helps get the word out there to others, and it tells all the different algorithms and stuff. People are listening and people are enjoying it, and that is very helpful. All right, let's talk about William Chalmers Burns, born in the year 1815 in Scotland. 
a uh, pretty pretty middle class, average type of fellow. His father was a minister, a Presbyterian minister, so he did kind of have a you know ministry adjacent uprising. Although he himself didn't seem to uh, take a particular interest in his early years, really in in a whole lot of anything. He went he, he was fine at school, wasn't brilliant, you know, and, and one of those one of those adequate guys, but not like super applying himself is is how I get the 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 vibe coming from him. Um, but what he did like to do was just get in some nature. He was, he was an outdoorsy type. He liked to go climbing trees, mountain climbing, you know, out hiking. Um, he would rather be doing that than reading books in school, uh, or going to church, uh, just being out in, in nature. He wanted to be like a, like a farmer. Like that was his dream. Like when he was 12, they asked him what he wanted to be. And he's like, I'm, I'm going for this farmer thing. That seems like the life to live animals and and grains and such so not not the story of a of a a prodigy minister uh, that we see in his childhood there he did talk about really liking pilgrim's progress um but other than that didn't seem to have much interest in spiritual things until you know the the track kind of shifts a little bit around 14 or so it seems his uncle uh, was a lawyer and I, I guess had a good rapport with him because through these conversations he had with his uncle, he was convinced uh, he had he had potential and that he should really shoot for a higher education and kind of got him interested in things of law and such. And so he did end up going to higher education, going to college, uh, getting a, a master in Greek and Latin. He went from wanting to become a farmer to shifting gears and like maybe being a farmer and a lawyer. <laughs> Eventually, he started earning honors and rewards and becoming a, a Greek tutor, and uh, he eventually graduated and was ready for a law career. So yeah, he was smart. He just, he just, wanted, just took him a while to apply himself, but it, it was it was there all along. You know, I, Joel, this just thought this just thought kind of came to me because on uh-huh. our next episode, we're talking about Martin Luther, who was also supposed to be going into law. How many preachers have we covered? Who were That's on true. their way into a degree in law, and then God changed them. Because uh, I think a John Calvin, he was another one who was on that law track kind of degree. I, I I feel like this is a really common thing. So law schools, watch out. Uh, it seems like the number one thing that keeps your lawyers from graduating is God sends them off to ministry. And so maybe that's the best thing you could do. Like it's the, there would be even more lawyers if the Lord wasn't constantly picking from them. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, there's that just, I, I just was thinking of that, especially I mean, between the, I'm going to become a businessman or I'm going to become a lawyer and then they end up becoming ministers. I just wonder how many of the people we cover. I'm I feel curious. like that is just a really common we story. Should- we should go back and dig through, you know, our old the old Yales and such, and see like what were yeah. the actual areas of study available to people. Maybe there True. was only like three, and law was one of them. Or yeah, something you like think that. about it, if there's only like medicine, maybe kind of some off branch of ministry, academics, and then law. Then I guess that really only le- if you're going to go to school for higher education, there's what there's only four positions really open to you. So maybe that's why they always seem like they were on their way mm-hmm. to law when suddenly they, that, that might, it might be as simple as that, Joel. All right. Well, uh, that's we'll what, that's let, what the uh, smart uh, people did. If you were smart, <laughs> then like you, uh, you went to law. Yeah. Right. All right. Well, if you know the answer to that question, please feel free to email us because I'm just now wondering it. And if you do not know the answer to that question, then, then research it and find the answer. Then, then email us and let us know that way we don't have to do it. You can do it for us. Now, when his dad was disappointed uh, that his son was kind of becoming a lawyer, he had really always hoped his son would become a minister like himself, which I find this kind of funny because uh, the guy had other children, and at one point his sister will kind of be like, the last person we thought would do anything useful for God was William. And so it's funny to me that his dad was like, oh, I really thought he was going to be a minister all along when he's, he just he always was out fishing, and then he wanted to become a lawyer. But no, no part of him really seemed interested in that aspect at all. But because his son was so firm in the opinion, i got to be a lawyer, he sends him to Edinburgh to kind of go get trained up and, you know, okay, go down that path, a trusty son. At the age of 16 or 17, it's one article said a tragedy, but when I when I tried to research and see what was the tragedy, I didn't see anyone else talking about a tragedy. So I, I, I think, I don't know if that's true, that there was a tragedy. And if there was one, it was not clear what it was. I looked several places, could not find any word on the tragedy. But what does seem to have changed him was that he began reading a book his dad gave him called Early Piety. Now, I know you're looking at your bookshelf and going, of course, Early Piety. I've read it a hundred times. Uh, but maybe not, though. Maybe if you're like me, you had never even heard of this book. 
And so you did what all great historian podcasters do. You put it into Google. And what you found was it is a book by Cotton Mather, which we've covered Cotton Mather multiple times on this episode, including a sermon he gave to pirates on death row. Go back a few, about 20 episodes, and you'll find it. Very good sermon. And what's important, you may be going, okay, just plugging, plugging your earlier podcast sermons. Yes, I am, because this <laughs> book, Early Piety, was actually a book of Cotton Mather sermons. So there it goes. It's relevant. His, his This book that he had, that his dad gave him, said, hey, I hope you read this someday, son. Well, for some reason, maybe through a tragedy, or maybe just because it was sitting there, he opens the book, and he reads a book of sermons by Cotton Mather with a little bit of a biography of a man named Nathaniel Mather. Seems to be a relative of Cotton's who died. That Cotton kind of covered down his story. When you look at that, church history, the story of a saint named Nathan, you know, a, a former Christian named Nathan uh, Nathaniel Mather there, and sermons of the past, and that's what does it. That's what brings Burns to Christ. Reading that book, he suddenly felt God calling him, and in that moment, he was totally changed. And to quote Burns himself, he said, God had apprehended me. I felt the conviction of my lost estate rushing through me with resistless power. I retire to a bedroom, and there I pour out my heart for the first time with tears and a genuine heartrending cry for mercy. Now, I don't, he, he said also in another place, basically, he suddenly became very aware of how just sinful he had been. Even though, if you look at Burns' life, he wasn't like a hardcore drinker. He wasn't beating anybody. He wasn't a gambler. He's no, he's none of the one of the bad guys per se, but he just was living for himself. And he suddenly was convicted of that. And it seems that I would love to give all the credit to old sermons and old church history. I do think that does deserve credit here. But also, I think the prayers of his family, reading the book his dad had long given him, clearly he was wrestling through it, and this was the source of it. But just, again, got to give credit. Look at that. God using old sermons to change lives just as he is today. Good job. What a, what a wonderful moment. It just you, you love to see it. Now, his oldest sister— Again, I mentioned before, it said that we never thought this guy, of all of the people in the family, would end up doing something good for God. But you can see here how God had different plans. And as soon as he had poured out his heart to God, as soon as he had met the living God, suddenly his plans and desires to study law were dead to him. And he now felt a deep calling to do what his dad had always prayed and hoped he would, which was to become a minister like his father. Yeah, so he went to go get theological training. And while there, he heard an old retired missionary describe his life overseas and the need for people to go. And, and Burns felt really convicted and called to become a missionary and get into missions work himself. This is 1838 at this point. And he asked to be sent out to India, uh, but at that time there was no availability for, for him to go to India. And so he was told to wait. And the next year in 1839, Robert Murray McShane, uh, who, again, we, we did an episode on two episodes ago, was told to take a break from preaching. And this is when Robert McShane would famously go on his trip out to Jerusalem um, to help kind of recover from his illness and, and partake on that adventure there. And it was William Burns here that uh, kind of took up the pulpit in his absence. And this, uh, I'm sure you can imagine, was probably terrifying for him, fresh out of, uh, you know, theological school, taking over a pretty substantial church uh, and filling the pulpit for an indeterminate amount of time, you know, a year plus, maybe more, who knows? And he's there as this interim pastor. And it's so funny to look at his quotes because it sounded like he was not very good at, at preaching. There's His brother wrote uh, of him at that time. He said he was young, inexperienced, measured in slow speech, gifted with no particular charm of poetry or sentiment of natural eloquence. <laughs> <laughs> which are yeah i've been i've been uh, that's been said of me as well so <laughs> if, if you're gonna if you're gonna see me preach somewhere you know maybe next summer when i'm in america please don't like start your review of me like that that would pretty much i mean it may be true yeah. but it would certainly hurt my feelings if that's the case slow speech <laughs> gifted with no particular charm of poetry or sentiment i love it i love how uh the his review is more uh, poetic than his uh, his <laughs> preaching, but but it also seemed to be that um, humbleness, that lack of of uh, polish, that gave him uh, a way with the crowd because it it came across as very genuine to him. And so, in the same light, 
we have people saying, you know, his brother would go on to say that this would really create a, an awe, a divine presence and majesty in the in the people. It would disarm the criticism and uh, end up kind of compelling even the most careless hearts to receive him as a messenger of God. So almost like this guy is so bad at, at preaching. I guess, it, you know, it, it allowed God to really shine through him because it wasn't, people weren't getting distracted with his characteristics and his mannerisms, but the message that he would be the preaching through, through the scriptures, it seemed to resonate well with people and kind of in his own way, he ended up being very effective. Yeah, it's definitely a case of the Lord using him. I mean, in some ways, that should be the goal of every minister, not that, oh, you're eloquent, you're you're charming, you're so good at it, but that the Lord is very present in your sermon. That's that's what every pastor should be aiming mm-hmm. for above even those other things that we, in fact, if you said the opposite, he was a, a gifted, great speaker. He was experienced. He had a beautiful charms and poetry. He's eloquent, but the Lord wasn't with him. Well, eh, that's pretty worthless to the kingdom, isn't mm-hmm. it? So in a lot of ways, Burns was doing the one thing it seemed he was called to do, which is surrendering to God and being used by God. During this time, uh, while he's at Robert Murray McChain's uh, 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 church during that era, his father asked him to kind of come over one Sunday and preach for him, just kind of do a little, I turn, attend, you know, kind of swap pastor thing. And he goes over, but while he's preaching, a revival kind of breaks out. Now, when we say revival, it can be kind of hard to define what that is. A different picture, especially depending on your denominational background or what your history with the church is, that might really picture different things. So just to kind of give a quick definition, revivals, at least when we kind of look at them in history, it's usually characterized by many people kind of coming together in that moment, turning to Christ at once, a really large movement of people just all repenting of their sin. And those same people suddenly have a hunger and desire to come to church. They'll worship for long hours together. They'll come and just read the Bible together. And it will not just usually sweep just one or two or a handful of people, but it will it will be almost as if the whole community will come together. And you'll see it maybe start at one church, but soon all of the villages and people in the area are all coming to these services, all to just be in the presence of God. Now, some people are very cynical when they hear about these revivals and they immediately assume, oh, it's emotionalism and stuff like that. And that was happening even during Burns' day. He did receive criticism. Uh, But the Great Awakening is considered usually by many people to be one of the very first of these kinds of revivals. It is interesting because I can't think of any revivals that happen like this really prior to the Great Awakening. I haven't maybe looked through them in history, but some people would say that the Reformation was a kind of revival as well. So it, it re- we're not gonna. We're not scholars on this kind of stuff. This is just what we're seeing happening as Burns is preaching, and he brings this back to McChain's church as he's preaching. There, hundreds of people are now coming to Christ, and wherever he's going, hundreds, even a thousand people in one service are suddenly giving their lives to Christ. And what Burns lacked in eloquence as a man in his mid twenties, he seemed to make up for be, for being direct and just speaking truth. And people say he spoke without the fear of man. But he did not accept responsibility for the revivals either. Uh, He always said, God is using me. That's all it is. He would spend several hours in prayer, like before these revivals, just asking God to use him. At nights before and after he would speak, pre and after services, he would set up these kind of prayer times so that people would get have opportunities to get right with God. And they would also set up these places for people to meet with him and just, you know, counseling, discipleship. It was a it was a big ordeal. This was not just one speaker kind of rolling through town, saying a bunch of nice words and then selling books or something. This was an intense process of praying, preaching. Your entire your entire life was dedicated to this. And the records are to be believed. The revival saw many people quit drinking. Hymns were now being sung in the villages. People said instead of the drinking songs they were known for. And it seemed like the places where this was happening, genuine change actually broke out that lasted more than just, you know, a year or two. They weren't just caught up in the emotions of the weeks, but it seemed to bring lasting change to the people of Scotland who were interacting with this specific revival. McChain, by the way, for his part, was famous for being in prayer at the very hour the revival started. Although he had been out of town, he almost died because of fever. He started praying for his church and then later on, him and his church found out the day he was praying for his church fervently, thinking he was going to die, was the same time the revival broke out at his church. And when he returned to Scotland, heard the news of the revival, he said there, the uh, Burns said there was not even a hint of jealousy on him. He couldn't have been more thrilled that his people were coming to Christ. And that was really all that mattered to him. He didn't care who got the credit for it. He was just happy God was using his friend Burns to bring people to Christ. Christ. And that, 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 I think that says a lot about McChain's character. You know, it'd be hard 
I think the best of men would be hard not to have a moment of jealousy, you know, a moment of Saul, like, oh, he's, he brought his thousands, but uh, Burns brings his tens of thousands, right? Like, a little bit of, it would be difficult not to go, oh, I've been laboring over these people for years, but under you, no, but McChain doesn't do any of that. He's just like, yes, awesome. I wanted these people to come to Christ. I'm so, so glad God used you to do it. Yeah, and so he 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 loved this for eight years. He would travel and preach, and uh, all throughout Scotland. Eventually, he was looking over at Ireland, saying, "Hey, Ireland needs the gospel too." In eighteen forty four, uh, he was invited to preach in Ireland, and he began studying Gaelic so that he could like better speak directly to the Irish people. Um, however, the, the revivals did not sweep across Ireland in the same way that they had across Scotland, and uh, he did not have a very warm reception there. He was uh, rejected and jeered a lot, uh, and they kind of kind of forced him out a little bit. He it, it didn't really phase him. He kept going. He kind of shifted gears and was looking around. He wanted uh, to go to Canada next, and so he began studying French to to be able to communicate with the French Canadians that were there. And he traveled with his uncle. Now, this is a different uncle than the the law uncle that uh, got him into education in the first place. So a different uncle than the one that that we mentioned from his childhood. But him and his uncle traveled to Canada. Uh, Again, kind of met with hostility there. Uh, He talked about having a, a very poor reception and being met with violence. We weren't quite sure... You know, he didn't really elaborate further. I don't know what that means, like to what to what extent was the violence made. Burns would move on from Canada, but that uncle that he traveled with would stay and settle down there and really work at uh, developing a church there in Toronto. And this uncle would eventually go on, his name was Robert Burns, uh, to become a professor at a seminary there in Toronto towards the end of his life. So it is interesting that um, I don't know. Maybe God used Burns to get this uncle there. You know, like, like it, it, it was never Burns' long game to to stay in Canada. As I mean, as it would turn out, but uh, his I don't I don't know why his uncle found purpose there and Burns didn't. But that seems to be what happened there. Uh, his uncle would do a lot of work in trying to connect North American churches with Scotland throughout the whole 19th century. So, um, interesting, interesting. How, I don't know, sometimes God uses other people just to get other people to where they need to be. Yeah, you know, that that could really be the summary of Burns. Like, he's the connector. Like, he's like a, a human bridge. Just this person needed to be in Canada. And so Ra- William Burns was the guy who, you know, transported him there. Because we're going to see this happen again and then again. And it just, it just boop, boop. This guy is kind of constantly moving one person from another place. Also, didn't mention it, but I put it in the notes. Robert Burns became a professor also of church history. Look at that. Church history making its way back again. Guys, it got to study. It's important. Okay. <laughs> back to William, uh, when he returns to Scotland in 1846, he was tired. He had spent years uh, traveling the world, learning these other languages, which, by the way, we're not giving enough credit for him. I could not. Gaelic is not an easy language to learn, and there's no Duolingo at the time doing this. Uh, I mean, he's doing this all on his own, pretty much. Uh, he's already he's speaking, I'm guessing, uh, you know, he's, he's got to have English, Latin, Greek. I'm sure he speaks is, is Scottish. Is Scottish a language, Joel? Uh, oof, that was oh, embarrassing. I don't, oh I really boy. don't know. There's no, uh, anyway, there's no he, way we can come out of that looking good. No, sorry, Scot- sorry, Scotland. I don't know what your language officially is. And uh, but he's got Gaelic now under his belt. He had to learn French. I mean, he's just he's tearing through these languages just to reach people on his speaking assignments. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. And all of this is before where he goes out and does missions, which he's been called to do. But his friends said when they saw him in 1846 returning to Scotland, his mind and his spirit were tired, and he had begun to acquire a look of age which he never really lost, which is rough. Remember, he was in his mid-20s when this all started, the young man experienced. Now he has a look of age which he can't lose. So this has been wearing him out. Yet all of this work was done for God before he even... Kind of, if we had nothing else, this would be enough to justify a revived thoughts on him, right? Like, he's definitely done a lot of great stuff, but this was just the beginning. His original goal was to go overseas and serve the Lord. In 1847, he finally gets that opportunity to go and be a missionary in China. Originally, he wanted to go to India, but China's the door that opened. And sometimes God knows. David Livingston originally wanted to go to China, God sent him to Africa. Lord knows where you need to be. Uh, some people, there were some de- delays and problems. People might have saying, look at all the people in China who didn't get to hear the gospel because of all these other things. However, 
while he was preaching and doing these tours, the first Protestant missionary who will end up going to Taiwan, George Leslie McKay, was actually saved in one of these meetings that uh, Burns had had. So again, if Burns had gone straight to the mission field in China, maybe he would have had the impact, but this George Leslie McKay would have probably not felt the call to missions to go to Taiwan. So look again how God is getting using Burns to move other people and connect other people to where they need to go. Now, as he left, a famous Scottish minister whom we covered a long time ago, Rabbi John Duncan, Rabbi Duncan, uh, called that not because he was a rabbi, but because he had been a missionary to the Jews in Hungary, and that's just the nickname he had kind of gotten working with them, told him, hey, when you're there overseas, take care of his cause, as in God's cause, and he will take care of your interests. So kind of a passing word from one missionary to another saying like, hey, this is what you need. Just focus on what God has for you, and God will take care of you. When asked when McChain, or sorry, when asked when Burns would be ready to go to China, he said, uh, "I'll be ready tomorrow. Just just send me. I'm ready to go." Mm-hmm. And that voyage to China, uh, specifically Hong Kong, took six months, which is whew, that is quite the time. But he but he used the time well because uh, leaving for this trip, he did not speak Chinese at all, and so he had six months to learn the language, and he did so pretty well. By the time they landed. He could read and speak Chinese on the basic level with without much trouble. On the voyage over, he himself was single. He didn't have any wife or kids, but he kind of became the the family pastor on the boat. And so they would have these daily devotion uh, sessions where they'd come together. And I mean, it's kind of just a, a neat vignette of his life to where this is just a, a small little six month sliver of his life, but you could make a whole book, uh, a whole movie just about what life on a boat was like for six months uh, in his makeshift little church learning and teaching uh, during that time. I'm sure he probably made some some deep and impactful relationships with the people around him. Once he got off the boat, uh, he was put to work quite quickly because he was given three men on death row to share the gospel with. He met with them every day and he would read the Bible to them every day until they were able to get better Chinese people there that that could share the gospel with them, people that could communicate better. After spending a year there, Burns felt confident that he knew the language well enough to begin kind of uh, traveling into the interior a bit, trying to travel into the more remote parts of China. And technically, this was breaking a treaty that Britain had signed. There were some opium wars that happened that, that we've talked about occasionally. Foreigners were technically supposed to stay out of the interior of China Burns did not do this. He he pressed forward and uh, started venturing in, and he made great progress in a lot of these villages sharing the gospel. And this is man, what, what you love to see the the the, the mid eighteen hundreds into the late eighteen hundreds. Feel like is that golden era of faith missions where people are just going out with no plans as far as food or you know material need, shelter, anything like that. They just trust the Lord. And uh, God provides, you know, it's, it's incredible to see. So he went in without any plans. He does get robbed at least once. Um, I'm sure that, I'm sure there's, you know, that it is hard. I'm sure those are trying times. I'm sure it requires faith, but, uh, you know, the Lord blessed him in that. He does have a few encounters that, w- with individuals that kind of force them out of the villages. But uh, largely, he seems to be being quite effective there. Now, Burns stayed busy. At one point, he'll open a school and teach boys to read and, you know, to read and write. And also, he'll teach them about walking with God. And then another point, he'll be working at a hospital and then working, you know, working kind of in the medicine ministry. And then suddenly, he'll be traveling through villages and going deep into the interior where, you know, no foreigner had ever gone before to share the gospel. He was constantly doing just whatever God seemed to have for him to do that day. Over time, he made great progress. He really learned Chinese on a deep level, deep enough that he was able to translate the first copy of Pilgrim's progress into Chinese. That book that as a kid, the only book he had had any interest reading that had spiritual themes to it was the first, he was the guy who would translate the first copy of that into uh, Chinese, which is, again, just another cool kind of wrapping up moment there in his life. He also would translate a lot of Christian hymns into Chinese for the first time. 
Now, if you remember, if you have listened to our episodes on the Taiping Rebellion, or you've listened to the one that we put out on the free feed here, uh, you know that this is a really hectic time to be in China. This is that same era when Hong Shuchuan is leading the Taiping Rebellion at the same exact time Burns is there. And you would also know that this is kind of an era where there's a lot of bandits and a lot of problems going on. So again, you have all these people who feel unsafe. There's all this war and crime and problems going on. And there's also this guy preaching that he's Jesus's brother taking over cities and forcing people to read the Bible and beheading them. And if you're hearing all that and going, I, what a story is that? Go back to our feed. Listen to the Typing Rebellion episode. It's absolutely wild. And if, you, if you're waiting for part two, part two is on Patreon. You can go sign up for Patreon and hear what happens to the end of that story. Uh, but it's an absolutely crazy story. And this is that era in China that Burns is in preaching the gospel. Uh, however, at one point, uh, the same kind of revival that swept over in Scotland begins to happen in a place called Xiamen, which is in South China, where people are coming every day to hear. And he reached a village where everyone wanted to hear the gospel, and people from all over were pouring in. They were praying. They were coming together in large groups. And this goes on for about two months. It's absolutely awesome and ends up being a huge revival. And then geopolitics ends up causing all these problems. We had mentioned in that episode of the Taiping Rebellion that there's these groups called the Triads, which were almost like these mafia group, criminal groups that have armies that cause problems. Well, they end up killing a bunch of British people. And the British people get mad, so they send an army into this region and start killing the Triads. And in the process, they basically, as far as I can tell, disrupt this revival. They basically sweep it off. They they put people away. Nobody can be out. We certainly don't have time for a revival right now. And this leads to a huge mess and Christians are getting kind of shot at at one point. Burns is taking care of injured people. And one of the British soldiers watching him just kind of remarks and says, they look at you as almost as if you are their father. And it's just, it's a sad moment where this kind of awesome revival is beginning to happen in South China and this geopolitical stuff ends up getting in the way. But it just shows to you the impact Burns was having on these people. You know, he wasn't just seeing revivals in Scotland or as he traveled to Canada and Ireland attempting there. He was making a huge impact in China as well. Now, this episode could go on for a while. Honestly, this, you're, you're listening, you're going, we already have a really long pre-up before the sermon. And I honestly am cutting a lot of stuff out and this, this could have really become easier easily a Martyrs and Missionaries episode. In fact, originally I had sent this guy to my wife as a Martyrs and Missionary, but then I saw he had a sermon. I was like, sorry, Elise, this one goes on Revive Thoughts because we, I love telling stories like this and we so rarely get to because most of the amazing missionaries were probably some of the best preachers, but we don't have their sermons. So because of just what the kind of work they did, their sermons didn't tend to get written down. So when I saw this guy had a sermon, I, I, had, to, I had to grab this one off of off of my wife and be like, sorry, this one, he needs to come to Revive Thoughts. We need to tell a story. Um, but before we completely put a wrap up on his time in China, there's still one more extremely important person he has to run into. And it's funny, as I remember reading in this guy's diary years ago about this guy, and I didn't even know I was reading about the same, that, about this man I'm telling you about now. I just remember vaguely hearing about this guy. In the mid 1860s, after a short trip to Scotland, he was back in China and he was near the Shanghai area and uh, his paths would cross with China's most famous missionary, Hudson Taylor. And both of them were going to inland villages. Both of them were wearing Chinese dress as to not cause alarm. And both of them, you know, had a heart for seeing the Chinese come to Christ. And Taylor famously said that being with Burns was like being in the presence of a saint. And the two of them, they, they didn't spend much time together. It was kind of this brief, brief crossing of paths, but they bonded very quickly over their common uh, methods and goal, Burns taught Taylor these three lessons that uh, he believed in. He said the first was God's purpose in permitting his servants to undergo suffering and frustration. The second was the importance of evangelism as the great work of the church. And the third was the place of lay evangelists as a lost order in the church. And that scripture required it to be restored. And so those were a few kind of theological topics that they, they talked about during their short time there. 
Hey, we'd love to be like sitting on that that table listening to them at night, you mm-hmm. know, in some in some village somewhere. Burns is a passionate man for God. At one point, uh, Taylor described seeing them like this whole village came together to worship an idol, and while they were worshiping at this idol, Burns just got up on stage and started yelling them like, "This is wrong. You're sinning. If you don't stop the ceremony, you need to stop. You guys need you're going to go to hell with these kind of things. Like paganism doesn't work." And so he's a very passionate guy. Uh, eventually, but but Taylor loved him and thought he was just the best. Eventually, Hudson Taylor and Burns will part ways both sad that they had to leave each other but glad that they had met each other after all uh, we could keep going about burns's life again this could easily turn to martyrs and missionaries at one point he'll be arrested for being a british spy that'll cause him a bunch of problems he'll make lots of progress in different parts of china but event finally in 1867 he moves to a part of china today called liaoning uh and it, i i appreciate this part of china because it was the part of china i lived in for it lived in for a year when my wife and i had only been married for a couple years we there and he moved there he they they needed a, a missionary to go out there. No one was there at the time, so he goes up there, but he doesn't last very long because it is very cold there, and he dies, probably just due to not being acclimated to the cold. And again, as somebody who has lived there, it is really, really cold in that part of China, so I can kind of understand. Um, you think of China, you usually think of tropical and, you know, uh, rainforesty maybe, or, or temples or big cities, humid. It's not in that part of China. It's freezing cold. There are many, many things to say about him and his influence from his his revivals in Scotland to his ministry in China to translation work he did to directing missions in the villages. Uh, this man was just a guy who had a mighty ministry that touched the lives of many, many people. Uh, not only did he interact with and network with people all over the world, but he directly touched the lives of two of the most famous people in the 1800s in terms of church history, Robert Murray McChain and Hudson Taylor. Now listen as we hear him give the funeral sermon for Robert Murray McChain. Uh, it's still just a few years out before he heads to China himself. Romans 8.30 And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. The design of the gospel is to bring many sons to glory. Now, we cannot speak long about this, but we may at least note that when God's people are glorified, they will be delivered from all evil of every kind, and then they will be delivered finally, perfectly, from all sin. Yes, when they reach glory, there will be a final and an eternal separation between their souls and sin. This is a prominent part of the glory to which they are raised. And those of you who know anything of sin will understand what it is to be delivered from it, to be freed from its very presence, to have its last remains taken away from the soul, and the soul left in the state in which Adam was created, or rather in a higher state, a state of perfection. The soul of the glorified saint will possess all those excellencies which belong to the human nature of Christ. It will be rendered holy as God is holy, and pure as he is pure. The mind, which used to be dark, will now be full of the light of God's own spirit. The conscience will be perfectly free from all deadness. The heart will be entirely purified, and will be centered on God himself. It will be fixed on God's excellency, on God as its portion. The will, too, shall then be entirely conformed to the will of Jehovah. And so the soul will be in all respects conformed to the image of God's dear Son. The body also will be delivered from all evil. The body of a child of God is subject to disease and death in this world like the bodies of others. But when the glory of God's children is completed on the last day, it will be raised up in glory, fashioned like Christ's glorious body and will shine in union with the soul, as Christ's body did on the Mount of Transfiguration, or as it now shines in glory at the right hand of the Majesty on high. This, then, is one piece of the glory to be revealed in the saints. Another, and a still higher part of it, is that they will see Christ as he is. All glory centers in Emmanuel as the only begotten of the Father, and the brightness of his glory, the mediator of the new covenant. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who triumphs over all his enemies and is exalted above all as the head of his body, the church. This glory of Christ is the present joy of God's children to think about by faith, but it is done currently as if under a shadow. But when they reach the heights of heaven, they will see him face to face and will be to all eternity filled with the unimaginable view of his glory, and more and more changed into the same image from glory to glory. The saints, when glorified, will share also in Christ's triumph and reign with him on his throne. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. To him that overcomes I will give, he says, to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father on his throne. The saints receive a kingdom, a kingdom that cannot be moved. The redeemed are kings to reign, as well as priests to serve, and they will reign with Christ forever and ever. And the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne will feed them, and will lead them to living fountains of water, and God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, dear friends, will you notice this little word, He, whom he justified, then he also glorified. The glory laid on the saints is the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And in as far as that glory belongs to the character of his people and consists in their conformity to the image of Emmanuel, it is God's work and God's work alone. It is he that begins the work of grace, and it is he that perfects it. He carries it on mightily and wondrously from step to step until at last the finishing touch is given to it and it is set apart as glorious and matchless to be admired forever. Ah, how wondrous must be the work of God in the soul of a believer at his departure. That moment when the old man is utterly destroyed and the soul is left completely and forever free from the last remains of sin this is the doing of the Lord, whom he justified, then he also glorified. Now there are two great changes noticed here which must precede this glorification. The one is justification, the other the divine calling. First, of justification, we are here assured that God glorifies none but those whom he has previously justified. Now there are two things implied in justification. The first is that the sinner is made righteous, the other that he is declared to be righteous. Many have got the idea that justification is declaring a sinner to be righteous and treating him as righteous, though he is not really so. But this is not the case. When God justifies, he makes the sinner righteous, and then declares him to be righteous, declares him to be what he really is. But how then is the sinner made righteous? On what ground is it that he is righteous, and is declared to be so? Not on the ground of anything in him, or that he has done or can do? No. The law demands perfection, and it will regard nothing else than that perfection which meets its demand. Such perfection can be found nowhere in the world as belonging properly and personally to any man. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And yet God justifies men. Yes, he even justifies the ungodly. But how? It is by their union to Emmanuel, the mediator of the new covenant, the magnifier of the law, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, who has finished transgression and made an end of sin, and brought in an everlasting righteousness, which is to all and on all that believe. This righteousness is the ground, the only the all-sufficient, the everlasting ground of a sinner's justification. And when the sinner is united to Emmanuel, whose work this is, he becomes in the eye of the law and of the judge not only righteous, but the righteousness of God. And now, being righteous, he is declared by God to be so. And let us be in awe of this, for the union of believers to Emmanuel is so intimate that we are said to be members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. 
Can you believe it is even compared to the essential and eternal union of the three divine persons in the one undivided, glorious Godhead? Now mark again that word, he, he justified. It is God's work to justify. God alone is the judge, and therefore God alone can justify. But when God justifies, who is he that can condemn? It is God who, in the person of the Son, has worked out and perfected that righteousness which is the ground of justification. It is God who, in the person of the Holy Spirit, reveals this righteousness to the sinner's conscience and leads him to embrace it as his only hope. And it is God the Father who, acting in the character of judge and sustaining the glory of the Godhead as injured by the sinner, it is he who imputes this righteousness to the soul constitutes the sinner the righteousness of God in Christ, and declares this wondrous sentence both now within the conscience and openly to all at the day of final judgment. And note, again, the connection between the two. Justification and future glory. It is intimate. It is inseparable. Whom he justified, then he also glorified. None can enter heaven that are not justified, this is contrary to God's very nature. But it is equally sure that none who are justified can fail to reach the glory to be revealed. The work of Jesus redeems from sin, it redeems us to God, and none for whom his blood has been shed, and to whom it is divinely applied, can possibly come short of the inheritance provided for them. If there is a soul now present that is justified, now note, it is justified and not merely that thinks itself to be so, that soul will be glorified. Let earth and hell combine their power, they cannot keep that soul out of heaven. And then, dear friends, there is to be noticed the other change which is here mentioned as preceding an entrance into glory. This is the calling of the sinner. You will mark that this calling is not that which Jesus speaks of when he says, Many are called, but few are chosen. That refers to the outward invitation which is given to all to whom the gospel comes. But this is that calling which is described as high, heavenly, and holy, by which the soul is turned from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God. Without this mighty call of God, Christ would continue to be despised in the sinner's heart and Satan would retain his power. But God sends out his mighty power. As the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. In the days of his flesh, Jesus called whom he would, and they followed him. The dead in trespasses and sins heard the voice of the Son of God and lived. And it is the same way now. He calls the sinner with that power, which said, Let there be light, and there was light. His call casts the devil out from man's heart so that he can hold it no longer. It breaks the power of sin in the soul and unites the soul to the person of Christ, creating within it a holy nature and renders it ready to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. This is indeed a high and holy calling, and it is a calling inseparably linked to justification. Whom he called then he also justified. It is by this calling that he is united centrally and permanently to Emmanuel as his righteousness. That life which God implants in the quickened soul is everlasting life. It cannot die, because Christ is its foundation, and the Holy Spirit, dwelling in the soul, creates and supports it. And this mighty change is to be ascribed to Jehovah alone. It is not the work of the sinner. All that he does is to hate and fight with God until God changes his will by an exertion of omnipotent power. It is not the work of ministers, nor of any outward ritual. These are used as tools, employed as channels of God's power. But the power is Jehovah's. And the very reason why he calls his chosen through such means is to show that the work is wholly his own. The treasure is in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God 
that gives the increase. Good impressions of God are made by particular methods and particular people. But all of these come short of that life which is spiritual, supernatural, and divine. Outward methods may embalm the dead, but cannot give them life itself. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, and Jehovah is the only author of the new creation, as of the old. We may suppose we can ourselves affect it, but how vast is the difference between the power to do evil and the power to do good? A little child can easily take away the life of an insect or a worm, but all the creatures of God cannot give back that life once it is gone. Sin has accomplished a ruin which none but Jehovah can repair. And the repairing of my soul is the greatest wonder of God's wisdom and power, as well as of his grace and love. Jehovah calls the dead. Jehovah justifies the ungodly. Jehovah glorifies the children of wrath. He calls, he justifies, and then he glorifies. And whom he calls, them he also justifies. Whom he justifies, them he also glorifies. The work is his from its beginning to its close, and where he begins, he will carry it on to the day of Jesus Christ. And now we must walk a step back that we may reach the cause and fountain of that salvation, whose perfection we have been attempting to trace, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. God works all things according to the counsel of his own will, and especially that salvation which is the greatest work accomplished in the history of time. The Mediator was set up from everlasting and appointed to his glorious work before the foundation of the world. The covenant of redemption in behalf of the church was made, and help was laid on one mighty to save, even from eternity. Yes, all the methods through which men are brought into union with Christ, as well as the Spirit's own agency, by which this is brought to pass, with the glory to which at last the church is praised. All these were ordained from eternity, and are accomplished in the times appointed by the Father. Here, however, in the words before us, we are specifically taught that the particular persons who are called and justified and at last glorified were chosen to be so from eternity. Whom, it is said, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And this is a truth evidently taught in many places, and one that is implied in every other part of the gospel. God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. Jacob he freely loves, and Esau he justly hates. Does God call one rather than another because he finds that soul better than the other? No, surely not. The carnal mind is at war against him, and every soul hates and fights against God until the will is changed by an act of almighty grace. It is not of works, but of him that calls. Who makes you different, O believer? True it is. You obeyed the call which others resisted, but why did you obey it? The Lord made you willing in a day of his power. And had you not been called in another way than those around you, you would, like them, have been lying at this moment, hated and condemned in the grave of your trespasses. You came to Christ because the Father drew you to himself, and all that the Father has given him will come to him, and those that come to him he will in no way case out. There is no justification without that heavenly calling which unites us to Emmanuel, and there is no future glory except for those who are called and justified. As you can see, all is traced back to that infinite love which alone has provided salvation, and it is on those who partake of this salvation, not for their sakes, but for the glory of Jehovah, as the God of love. Nor can those who are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world fail to reach that glory which is provided for them. Whatever enemies may oppose their entering into heaven, whatever obstacles may stand between them and the glory of God, they cannot stop it. Whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What will we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, 
then won't he freely give us all things? Let us now mention a few general thoughts from this great subject, how great God's salvation is. This salvation takes its rise from the infinite ocean of the Father's love and compassion, and it will fill the eternal heavens with the hallelujahs of a great multitude whom no man can number. The scheme of this salvation is the center of Jehovah's eternal counsels. Its accomplishment is the greatest event of all time, and its completion will be admired and celebrated throughout eternity. Like God himself, this salvation is high as heaven. What can we do? Deeper than hell, what can we know? The measure of it is longer than the earth. It is broader than the sea. Oh, you heir of glory, you child of God, how little have you known of this salvation? Ministers can never speak enough on it. When we enter heaven, it will seem as if we had never heard of it before. How will you escape those who despise it, who neglect it? It has been all freely offered to you by Jehovah times, without number, and yet you have preferred the world, or self, or sin, instead of it. Oh, what your loss will be! How awful and how just your condemnation! Awake, you that are sleeping, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Salvation is of grace. Grace reigns in its eternal plan, in its purchase by the blood of Emmanuel, in our effectual calling, in our final glory. It is all free, free electing love, free calling, free justification, and free glory. All is the gift of God. Because it is all free, it is suited for you, O oh, lost sinner, for it is all freely offered to you. You may not know for certain that you are one of God's elect, but none ever knew this till they came to Jesus. Begin with the freeness of grace, and then consider the sovereignty of the one who gave it. Take the doctrine of the third chapter of the Romans, and when you have been condemned to die, and have received Christ as your righteousness, you will then turn to this chapter, and rejoice to trace all up to God's eternal electing love, and to say, I love him, because he first loved me. Salvation is infallibly secured to all the seed. Were it left to the free will of fallen man to determine whether Jesus should reign or not, his whole work would be in vain, because all would reject him. God has, however, provided against the possibility of this by giving to his Son a chosen people as the fruit of the toil of his soul. And he has engaged his truth and faithfulness in covenant to his Son, that these will all be gathered to him in the proper time. Were none elected, none would be saved. The people of God would perish like the world, and Jesus would lose his glory. Let this doctrine humble the sinners, but not discourage them. We must attend to the free offers of salvation first, and assure the one that comes, Jesus will in no way cast out. His sovereignty does not limit his love, but shows its greatness. True, he might have saved all, but he did not. And for acting this way, he has wise and holy reasons. He will show his wrath as well as make known his mercy. He will manifest his justice in condemning as well as his grace in saving. But remember that all evil is of the creature, all good of the Creator. It is on account of sin, and that alone, that sinners are condemned. And the only reason why all who hear the gospel are not saved is this, that they will not come to Jesus, but crazily to reject him, because of enmity, pride, and love of sin. The glory of salvation belongs to God alone. It is all of God, and therefore all the glory is his. The love which originated it is his. The righteousness which purchased it is his. The grace which makes it ours is his. The glory to which it leads is his. And therefore, all the glory belongs to him. Learn, child of God, to trace all you are by grace, and all you hope to be in glory, back to Jehovah. If he has called you, give him the glory. Give it to no tools, 
to no instrument, to no effort of your own. It has come to you through human channels, but it has come from Jehovah. It is a fruit of his free, fathomless, eternal love and compassion. Learn this in your own case, and in the case of others. You have lived in a wondrous time, and in a favored spot. It is exactly four years since I first met you in this place, and what wonders have been taking place since that time. Many parts of Scotland have been visited by the Holy Spirit in a way unparalleled among us for at least a hundred years, and this place has not been passed over either. How many ministers have preached among you since that time? How many sermons you have heard? With what fullness and power from on high the terrors of the Lord and the unsearchable riches of Christ have been set before you? Who has done all this? Who has made this place to differ from others that have not been rained upon? Yet many among you have trampled underfoot the Son of God, and if they do not repent, there remains nothing but a certain fearful future of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour all God's adversaries. But some among you have been saved, some of the young, some of the middle-aged, some of the old, a few of the rich, and more of the poor. Not a few have been called and justified, and some are even glorified. Now, to whom does the praise of all this belong? Does it belong to you, O follower of Jesus? Does it belong to those who have preached among you? No, salvation is of the Lord. Let no flesh glory in his presence. But he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. The Father sent the Savior of his free love, and he draws the sinner to him of the same love. The Savior is sent, the sinner is drawn, and so they meet and are united. The sinner is saved, the Savior is glorified, and this great truth especially applies to your present circumstances. As bereaved of a faithful and beloved pastor, who three weeks ago stood here preaching and was completely healthy, but he is now stretched in the newly closed grave beside us. In a case like this, you all are in danger to beware of idolizing a man. See to it that, while you recognize the excellencies of his character, you judge by the standard of the sanctuary. Seeing that the things which are highly esteemed among men are an abomination in the sight of God, you must separate between what was of the flesh and what was of the spirit in him. Leave the shame of the one to the creature, and give the glory of the other to Jehovah. Remembering what is said of Paul, they glorified God in me. You must not glory in the man, but glorify God in him. To do the one is idolatry, the most heinous of all sins, and the one which God will most awfully avenge. To do the other is to give to God that profit which is his alone. Keep these things in remembrance, while I bring to your recollection one or two of those excellent characteristics which have struck me as evidence of the grace of God in your lamented pastor. He was eminently endowed with natural gifts. Had he remained under sin, he might never have distinguished himself in a world where not many of the smart are called, and where the finest powers of intellect and genius are so often devoted to the service of Satan. But, when sanctified by grace, he was one of the most amiable, accomplished, and pleasant among the children of God, or among the ministers of Christ. But I would rather dwell on what he was through grace. Many have admired his amiable and engaging character, but they see no beauty in that which above all distinguished him and will distinguish him to all eternity. I do not know. It is a shame I never asked him the early story of God's work in his soul, but it was easy to observe, and this I was struck with when I first saw him and heard him speak. It was in a missionary meeting at Glasgow five years ago, and I saw that Christ lived in him. This is the hidden and mysterious fountain of all graces in God's children. 
Christ is their life. He lives in them. From this we see the constant nearness to Christ which marked his character and shone in his ministry. Christ and his salvation and his love were not with him as it is with many good theologians and well-informed professors, a collection of doctrines or mere principles. But he realized the presence and rejoiced in the love of a living Emmanuel, dwelling in him as his life. This appeared in him at all times, in private, in the family, in the pulpit, and in his labors from house to house. No one could be with him without feeling that he rejoiced in the presence of a living Savior. And when he spoke to sinners, they could not help but feel that he spoke to them not merely of dead principles or an abstract salvation, but to him who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, who was dead and is alive forevermore and has the keys of hell and of death. From Christ as his life, he was constantly drawing, as he fed on his word with great delight, and as he waited on him from hour to hour and from day to day at his footstool and in his work. As Christ was his life and lived in him, so he lived not to himself, but to him who died for him. What could you find him engaged in that did not directly concern the work and glory of Emmanuel? It seemed to him as his meat and his drink to labor for him, vindicating his honor and commending him to a perishing world. And in all this he truly seemed, through grace, to seek Christ's glory as his goal. Oh, alas, we may do much in connection with Christ and his cause, and yet please and exalt ourselves in the end. You did it not to me, is a word which will reach many who had never dreamed they'd hear it, and assigns them to a portion among the enemies of God when they hoped to be among his friends. We cannot judge the heart but our dear departed brother seemed to have had a special triumph over that sin which holds so many captive. I had myself a peculiar opportunity of seeing this humility of his, which I would now mention to you for God's honor. You know that it pleased God, during his absence in 1839, to visit this people with his salvation in a remarkable manner. And doubtless my heart and the hearts of many of you were knit together at such a time to a special degree. Coming back in such circumstances to a people among whom he had been blessed, and whose affections had gathered round him, there was much that met him to excite, and in the case of one less sanctified, would have excited perhaps some suspicion and jealousy. And yet, though others might be jealous or suspicious who were less exposed to the temptation, I never on one occasion, even in a look, could say that I discovered such a thing in him. The imperfections and sins which attached to much that was done at that time were noticed by others. But from the first moment he rejoiced in all that was of God and gave him the glory, seeming to leave it to others who had more delight in it, to seek for causes of offense. And indeed, from that day till the last when I parted from him, he acted towards me with an openness and tenderness which rendered his friendship the most endearing that I ever enjoyed. I can only dream of having a friend like that again some day. I record this story to the glory of God, because it was one of the greatest tests of his character in public life, and one in which he seemed to be more than conqueror through him that loved him. In his ministry, from the very first, the sum and center of his teaching was Jesus Christ, and him crucified. All that he taught either spoke of him directly, or was taught in connection with him. He taught the law of God to lead to Jesus and show the glory of his work. He dwelt on his glory, his grace, his love, his fullness, his perfection to the case of every sinner, and his willingness to save and when he opened up the duties of the children of God, Christ was their example, and Christ their strength, and Christ's glory their end. He spoke of Jesus with the seriousness and savor of one who knew and adored him, and with the fullness of an overflowing heart. In this he was a flower of Paul, and of all faithful 
and successful ministers of Christ. And as you know, there was no view of Christ which he more dwelt upon than that which is strangest and most opposed to the carnal man, but dearest of all to the true Christian, his obedience and his blood as the guarantee of God's church. He found Christ's glory in every part of the Bible, in every book, in every page. And from this, his work showed a sweet freshness and variety, and were brought before you as newly plucked flowers, fragrant with the dew of God's grace. In preaching of Christ, his dependence rested solely on the power of the Spirit. He knew from the beginning that men were dead, literally dead, in sins, and that no means could raise them without the agency of the Holy Spirit. And I think that his impressions of this grand truth became deeper as he advanced in relationship with his own heart and with the hearts of others. He therefore rejoiced in the gospel as the ministry of the Spirit and pleaded incessantly for the promise of the Father. These two truths, justification by the righteousness of Emmanuel and regeneration by the agency of the Holy Spirit, are indeed the very poles of the whole system of revelation, and they were certainly the truths to which all his doctrine pointed, and in which his life as well as his ministry was centered, and this is what explains his success. Nothing will make up in the ministry of the gospel or in the life of an individual soul for the lack of the righteousness of Christ as the foundation of our acceptance, nor will this be retained as a living doctrine and produce living results, unless equally with it we hold fast the truth that man is dead in sin and must be created anew by the Holy Ghost. We must be partakers of the power of Christ's resurrection as well as the fellowship of his sufferings. Oh, if these grand foundations of our faith and hope were regularly declared and acted on, saints would be fed, sinners would be gathered, and God would be glorified. In this, as in other things, our departed brother was an example to many, although let it be remembered that he is not our standard. He had much to learn, doubtless, in regard to these things, and we are only to follow him as he followed Christ. But which of you can forget the graces which he displayed in his ministry and in his life? To take one characteristic, he was eminently faithful. In public, he kept back nothing that he knew to be profitable. He did not fear to tell the truth, for whoever it might reach. And his faithfulness was not the kind which takes refuge in the pulpit but is worked on by fear or flattery when he was out of it. If there was difference, he was more faithful to individuals than he was to congregations. And whether in his letters, as some of us know, or in conversation, he would not suffer sin to take hold of another, but was jealous over all with a godly jealousy, seeking to profit rather than to please, and yet to also please while he profited by uniting the most winning openness and tenderness with his faithfulness. He was gentle naturally, and yet, as many of you know, he was bold as a lion when the good of souls and the glory of the Lord were at stake. Remember, for instance, the noble part he played in connection with that fearful sin of Sabbath breaking in which the Edinburgh and Glasgow Railway Company persisted in defiance of Jehovah and under the dark shadow of his coming judgments. I remember also, on one occasion, having followed him when he went in, an unwelcome visitor, upon a company of young people as they danced in a place not far from here, and I can never forget the awful seriousness with which he warned and begged them to flee from the wrath to come. Oh, how many of you, how many around you have a testimony to his faithfulness with you this day? How awful will it be for some of you when his words are a testimony against you on that day when you meet God's servant at the great white throne? Certainly, any sinners and backsliders, you have been warned, 
You are witnesses that God's servant is free from your blood. You are witnesses against yourselves if you do not repent and believe the gospel. These are but a few examples from among the multitude which his life gives us and which the memories of many of you can add of the earnestness, faithfulness, and zeal with which he labored. If we tried to mention all the features of his character, I would need to explain almost all characteristics which should belong to a minister of Jesus Christ. I will only therefore notice further that he was a man of prayer, an Enoch, who walked with God, pleading not at certain times only, but from hour to hour, for nearer conformity to the image of Jesus, and a saving blessing on his flock and on the world at large. In no respect is our loss greater than in this, that he is no longer allowed to enter the sacred prayer space by the blood of Jesus as an intercessor for sinners and for the church of God. He came out from his prayer closet on many occasions with much of Jehovah's presence in his soul and in his countenance. Now he has exchanged the throne of grace for the throne of glory. He has ceased to pray and has we do not doubt, join the eternal hallelujah of the redeemed, crying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Salvation to him that sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Those who did not know your beloved pastor may suppose that I have spoken in a manner stronger than was warranted of a man. But those who knew him will know it is not easy to speak of all he had done. And now, when we look around the church of our fathers, on this day when she is put into the medical wing of the Lord's army, with a need of someone to fill the pulpit and lift her up, we cannot easily find anyone who is in all respects like him, or will fill his place. Our loss is great indeed, but we must remember that the Lord's grace was great in giving us so much to lose, and though he is gone, and gone from us at a time when he seemed especially needed, it becomes us to be dumb with silence, not opening the mouth, because the Lord has done it. May his death awaken those whom he could not awaken in life. May the people of God among you, having seen him bearing the cross and at last receiving the crown, follow in his footsteps until you see him again in glory. And may we who are left behind him in the battlefield be faithful to death and like him, Receive the crown of life. To God be the glory. Amen. Burns, I, I just, I really appreciate what he says in the sermon, how he talks about Murray McChain and just the man that he is. He just, he really both gives a testimony to how good a guy he was. He was a genuinely great guy, but he also grounds it in the reality of God is what made him good. And don't get caught in the idea of, oh no, our great, wonderful pastor is gone. We're doomed. You know, he kind of calls all men need to live more like Robert Murray McChain. And you, you could just see that both he extreme Burns extremely respected him, but also he expected lots of other people to kind of live up to what he had done and who he had been. Uh, I just think he's a, Burns is a really interesting. Both you can just tell a genuinely good guy. And it wasn't something we got time to mention in the intro. Our intro that was the longest intro Joel and I think we've ever done before a sermon was trying to cover this guy's life. And again, I had to cut so many pieces out. Um, but he was a genuinely actually a very jovial, like good humored guy. Like he doesn't show in his serious, sincere ministry side of him. But like, if you met him on the streets, you would have probably been laughing and having a great time. He was just a genuinely good guy. And it, it always makes me sad that so many of these kinds of people have been forgotten. We're going to get to heaven and there are going to be so many of these amazing saints who have these super palaces in heaven. And they're, and you're going to go, oh, is that, you know, the amazing faithful janitor who served his church and discipled? And yeah, you know what? They're going to be those guys too. But then they're going to be these people like William Chalmers Burns and some of the other people we've covered on our show who you're going to go, no, you don't know about this guy's ministry. He did all these amazing things and you've somehow never heard about him. You're going to go, wow, like how did such a wonderful person in history end up getting forgotten? And you think of all the people in history we do remember that are just not worth a lot. And then you think of these amazing people in history who just had these incredible ministries and lives 
and we don't remember them at all. And it just, it makes me sad. But I, as I said at the beginning of the top of the episode, it also makes me extremely happy to do what we do at Revive Thoughts, that we get to help research and bring their story back to life and let you hear their sermons again. I think it's a great privilege and a great honor. And so I do love that we get to do that. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Timothy Furens. Big thanks to Timothy for reading today's sermon. You can check out his YouTube channel. He has a a YouTube called Old Timey Preaching. Link to that in the description below. If you listened to this episode of Revive Thoughts and you enjoyed it, we encourage you, give it a share. Send it to somebody you don't know. You know, at the beginning of this episode, we talked about how uh, William Chalmers Burns came to Christ because somebody, because somebody, his father, gave him a book of old church history sermons. I think that church history sermons still have amazing power today, that God uses them in the lives of others. So share this show, share this episode. I bet you whoever you share it with has never heard of William Chalmers Burns before. And I, I think that they will be highly encouraged by the life that we live. So put this out there on social media or send it directly to somebody that you know and tell them about this guy. Tell them about this sermon, this amazing life lived. Uh, I, I, I guarantee you they'll learn something they hadn't known before. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts.